By now, you have heard the story. Ukraine's spring 2023 counteroffensive became Ukraine's summer 2023 counteroffensive. What started as an attempt to get to the Sea of Azov, or at least to Melitopol, evolved into a war of attrition, mostly along a stagnant front line. And while there is still time for that to change, it appears increasingly likely that Ukraine's theory of victory has vanished into oblivion. As a result, the status quo will freeze and become a de facto international border. But what if the conventional public narrative has Ukraine's theory of victory all wrong? Today, we are going to explore the possibility that Ukraine has actively chosen to pursue an attritional strategy, because it plays to a potential strength. It is a gamble that the Kremlin is politically unwilling to mobilize again, and that all Ukraine needs to do is methodically eliminate the force that Russia currently has deployed, at which point the de facto border will forever disappear. Specifically, we will begin by describing the puzzling discrepancy between traditional military theory and Ukraine's strategy for the offensive, the public perception of Ukraine's overall theory of victory, the frustration among American strategists regarding Ukraine's actions, Ukraine's strategic transition to a war of attrition, a fundamental misunderstanding of how wars of attrition work that nevertheless is commonly parroted, an alternative theory of victory that Ukraine may instead be pursuing, and why we may soon be finding out whether the alternative theory of victory will work or not. But we start with the puzzle. Traditionally, the advantage of being on the offensive is that you get to concentrate most of your troops in one position, while the other side is spread across the entire front line. With perhaps a notable exception at the beginning of the counteroffensive, which we will return to later, Ukraine has not seemed to do this. Russia has indeed spread out its troops to protect the whole line. Meanwhile, Ukraine has placed the plurality of its troops to push just east of the hook in the Dnipro River, but there remains some effort to establish a bridgehead across from Kherson City. Jumping over Zaporizhia, Ukraine also has a small push going on along Donetsk's southern front line. Then there is the effort to recapture Bakhmut, where Ukraine may have made its most recent notable gain, coming 13 kilometers south of Bakhmut's city center. And Kyiv has stationed troops even further north, though that is mainly to hold back a small Russian offensive. Perhaps as a result of this, Ukraine's tangible gains on the ground have been rather small thus far, mostly confined to the area where the plurality of Ukrainian troops are deployed. This appears to be a sticking point for some strategists in the United States, who desperately want Ukraine to congregate troops in one area and make a major push to get this war moving. Ukraine knows that the U.S. is advising this, and knows the traditional benefit of doing so. And yet, Ukraine is keeping everyone spread out. Hence the puzzle. Why? The answer may be a discrepancy between the public perception of Ukraine's theory of victory and what Ukraine's actual perception of it may be. Let's cover the public perception first. The central theme of this war has been one of logistics from the start. First with the Russian failures along the Kyiv front, then the attack on the Crimean bridge, followed by the isolation of Russia-occupied Kherson city, last year's winter drain, another attack on the Crimean bridge, and the more general infrastructure battle using the High Mars system. Continuing with that pattern, the obvious goal for Ukraine's offensive was to cut Russia in half along the Crimean land bridge. The clearest way to do that, of course, was for Ukraine to reach the Sea of Azov, wherever along the coast that may have been. Getting all the way there was not strictly necessary for success, though. Zooming in, capturing Melitopol was almost as good of a goal. Given the intersection of the main highways, it remains Russia's logistical hub in the area. Tokmak was a more modest goal, as a smaller city and a smaller part of that logistical network. Cities aside, 
At minimum, Ukraine needed to drive about 20 kilometers south from the line of control at the start of the offensive. This was not for a city in particular, but just due to the math of missiles. Specifically, HIMARS Gimler's missiles have an effective range of about 80 kilometers. Ukraine began the offensive about here, approximately 90 kilometers away from the M14 highway, the southernmost of the good supply routes. Technically, Ukraine could get to the required range with only 10 kilometers of progress. But Ukraine needed to throw in a little bit extra as cushion. The military does not want to make a high Mars truck an easy target for frontline Russian artillery. Given that, the front line needs to move to about 70 kilometers. And so Ukraine had 20 kilometers of necessary progress to reach that goal. Once Ukrainian troops hit there, they can combine the damage to the M14 highway, together with Ukraine's frequent targeting of the Crimean Bridge, as well as a smaller bridge where the peninsula meets the mainland. That is what the Storm Shadow missile is for, and the Attackums may soon be joining the fray as well. The result would be this huge swath of Russian-held territory under an immense logistical crunch. The conventional wisdom regarding Ukraine's theory of victory is that accomplishing this would leave Russia's position in the south untenable, thereby forcing Russia to withdraw from the area, similar to what happened in Kherson City circa November 2022. Or, if Russian troops were to stay and fight it out, then Ukraine could just beat them the old-fashioned way. What happens in Crimea or the Donbass afterward would be anyone's guess. Anyway, if cutting the land bridge was Ukraine's goal, it has failed thus far, with a notable emphasis on thus far. Let's turn back the clock for a moment to the start of the offensive, and go to Zaporizhia, just east of the Dnipro River. Again, this is where the plurality of Ukrainian troops congregated for the offensive at the start. And indeed, it is where Ukraine has seen the most success during the past few months. However, that success has been measured in villages rather than cities. Specifically, the frontier is somewhere around Robotnye, which is about here. It is well short of even Tokmak, had a population of 480 the last time that Ukraine took a census, and does not look strategically important at all. Ukraine is also looking to widen the salient that is forming toward the east, to reduce opportunities for a Russian counterattack. In that light, the difference between this offensive thus far, there's that phrase again, and 2022's, is night and day. Ukraine regained 1.67% of its total territory in September 2022, 0.45% in October, and 0.73% in November. Compare that to the ongoing offensive, with 0.02% in May 2023, 0.04% in June, 0.01% in July, and again 0.01% in August. Looking at the map overall, Russia still controls 17.49% of Ukrainian territory, and 10.45% not including Crimea. At the current rate of the 2023 offensive, Ukraine will return to the status quo pre-invasion sometime in 2067, by which point Ukraine will maybe finally get those F-16s, and when hopefully we will finally have 3D lines on maps. On second thought, that would create a giant headache of perspective. The good news for Ukraine is that the troops are about halfway to the 20 kilometer minimum goal. The bad news is that it has been unseasonably rainy over the offensive's prime months, and Ukraine only has another month or two to finish things off, before Rasputitsa pauses things once again. This is where the frustration from American military strategists starts to arise. With the clock dwindling, the United States would like to see Ukraine concentrate its forces along that axis, and make one final push. If they get to 20 kilometers, then great. Afterward, send in the HIMARS, and prep for the winter logistics battle. If they get even further, all the better. If they do not, well, better to try and fail than just fail slowly.
Instead, Ukraine has spent most of the summer dancing around the frontest of the front lines, with the success going toward Robotnye seemingly coming as an incidental benefit. But to get any further, Ukraine will have to start making a more concerted effort, as the blue and yellow troops must now contend with the meat of the Sorovikin line. These are the true fortifications that Russia spent the previous winter building, full of trenches, anti-tank dragon's teeth, landmines, and a whole bunch of other goodies, and named after Sergei Surovikin, that Russian general that vanished after the Wagner mutiny, and whom we were once upon a time trying to find hidden in the slides, until he magically reappeared. Hey, it's better than the alternative. Of course, this also comes with the thus far caveat that things could still change. The Kharkiv Blitz back in September 2022 could happen because Russia did not have much in the way of fortifications there at that point. So if Ukraine routed a unit, it could immediately take the corresponding territory and then repeat that process all the way down the line. In contrast, now that the Surovikin line is all over the place, territorial control and trench captures are more of lagged indicators. That is, Ukraine causes sufficient damage to Russia, then takes a block of territory, rather than making those small, rapid, and cumulative gains from the prior year. This is why the offensive keeps drawing comparisons to the slow aftermath of the Normandy landings. However, that skeptical set of policymakers believes that this is coming from an intentional strategic blunder that Ukraine is making, and just wants the concentration to happen already. But the fact that there is intention behind Ukraine's strategy makes it worth a deeper dive. In particular, Ukraine switched to an attritional approach. It seemed like in the very first days of the offensive that Ukraine was attempting a maneuver strategy, akin to Kharkiv. Then came the reports of Russia destroying Ukraine's Bradley fighting vehicles. And then, in short order, reports of Ukraine abandoning the modified combined arms approach that the West had been teaching its soldiers throughout the winter. Ukraine thus reverted to attrition, intentionally refusing to engage in the Sorovikin line, and instead playing at the fringes. It is not as though Ukraine is averse to taking advantage of openings, hence the progress near Robotnye. And some optimists think that Ukraine has already defeated the tougher parts of the line, meaning that the rest of this process will be possible without greater troop concentrations. It is just that Ukraine is not looking to create and exploit those opportunities, and, at least on paper, that looks like a disaster of an idea. The Surovikin line is the best set of defensive entrenchments that Russia has, meaning that the casualty ratio for Ukraine is nowhere near as favorable as the heyday of the Battle of Bakhmut. Continuing with this theory, the numbers don't lie, and they spell disaster for Ukraine because Kyiv has less to sacrifice. Ukraine is a smaller country. It has less money. It has fewer people. It has fewer soldiers. It has fewer tanks. And it has fewer artillery shells. Ukraine might win on pluckiness, but that is a small consolation. Of course, the West is providing assistance on many of these dimensions, which swamps whatever help Russia may be receiving from North Korea or Iran. But there are still concerns about the longevity of that support, never mind that Ukraine is all on its own for the soldiers' metric. As such, if Ukraine spends the rest of the war trading one for one, the pure visuals tell the story by themselves. Eventually, there will be nothing left of the country, even if the West continues its aid programs. And that is a fair concern. If these were the only metrics there were data on, then I would definitely want to be on the side with all of the check marks. However, the overall argument fundamentally misunderstands how wars of attrition work. The goal is not to literally go until the other side has nothing left. It is to push forward and convince the other side to give up. Obviously, the three M's, money, men, and materiel, factor into this. 
It is much easier to say that you are not giving up when you have plenty of those in reserve. But the missing factor is resolve. War is not a game of chess or Magic the Gathering, where a win is the same whether your queen is still standing, or whether you are at 20 life, or at just one life. All that money and all those men could be put to a better use, instead of just being lit on fire. Because of that trade-off, you can be vastly outnumbered and still win a showdown, if the other side simply decides that winning is not worth the price, even if victory is assured. That is why the United States failed in Vietnam. American troops did not lose the battle in a military sense, so much as Washington lost the political battle, which then triggered the American withdrawal. Perhaps more relevant for today's matters, Afghanistan was the Soviet version of Vietnam and had the analogous ending. Literally the largest country in history lost to another country, with a GDP approximately 1 70th of Elon Musk's net worth. Real talk for a second. Get rid of all the other information, fade to black. I cannot emphasize this enough. Despite what you might read in the comments, war is a gigantic math problem. That is why militaries employ a ton of people to do the calculations. You just do not hear about it often because it is not very sexy. Sorry guys. Nor does it make for a good action figure, and rarely does it make for a good movie. But best of luck to your military if you have no one manning your spreadsheets. With that said, wars of attrition are not, and never have been, exercises in counting. So the next time you hear someone say that Ukraine cannot win a war of attrition, do yourself a favor, click on the X button, and move on to your next piece of content. And for the sake of symmetry, the next time you hear someone say that Russia cannot win because Ukrainians care more about what they are fighting over, well, wars of attrition are not determined exclusively by who has the most heart either. And that takes us to a possible alternative theory of victory for Ukraine. Imagine that you are Zelensky, and a few months ago, your chief intelligence directorate put a report on your desk. The memo begins. The political situation in Russia is much worse than it appears. Vladimir Putin's regime is in a perilous position. We do not anticipate that he will lose office given the status quo situation. However, if Russia were to engage in another round of mass mobilization, the narrative of Putin the popular leader would shatter. He would immediately face direct challenges, general strikes, mass protests, and usurpers from within. As a result, further mobilizations are off the table. The troops that Russia has in Ukraine are the troops that Russia will have in Ukraine. There are no more reinforcements. End memo. In other words, Putin's hand is not full of mobilization opportunities. Instead, he is limited to less powerful alternatives that cannot sustain the front lines. Perhaps equally as important, the intel report may also indicate that Putin is not afraid of a lost war, and thus sees no incentive to gamble on a mobilization which could actually cause a problem. So which is it? Or does Russia have a little bit of mobilization left, but not much? I don't know. And that is the point. It is not obvious when we do not have the inside story and have to work off information that is publicly available. That means that what you are viewing is essentially an open source intelligence report, an effort to examine a puzzle and speculate on a plausible explanation for it. Here, that is Ukraine's strategy as the puzzle, and the hypothetical memo as the explanation. Anyway, Russia's parliament recently passed legislation extending the eligible age range for conscription, which suggests some baseline preparation for a second round. On the other hand, that is a far cry from actually mobilizing and deploying soldiers, and it is something you might be interested in doing if you were weaker, but still wanted to bluff strength. And there are some indications that the Kremlin is indeed worried. We do know that the last time Russia mobilized, it was not well received by the Russian public. Moreover, where those soldiers came from is another important part of the story. On a per capita basis, 
Russia drew fresh recruits disproportionately from its outlying regions, and the pool to go back there a second time will be shallow. That means that more soldiers would have to come from the scantily mobilized Moscow and St. Petersburg, which means there will be far more political problems with such an action. There are other signs of reluctance to mobilize, like looking to Cuba to recruit mercenaries, which, while making this feel more like the pinnacle of the Cold War, is still a bizarre thing to do if you could instead source your troops from home. Further, the evidence points to Russia having blown the Kohovka Dam to cover for its manpower shortage, despite the environmental catastrophe it caused in the floodplain downstream, within territory that Russia declared annexed, and indeed still controls a fair bit of, never mind that it created the water level for the North Crimean Canal, and thus was necessary for the peninsula's agricultural production. We also witnessed the Wagner Opera, and how latent support for Putin's regime was far weaker than what one might have predicted. Cue the fog of war cliché, but this is exactly the type of thing that causes wars to occur and continue. Anyway, imagine for a second that this intelligence report did actually cross Zelensky's desk. What should he command his military to do? Perhaps Ukraine's theory of victory was to try everything to cut the bridge in half. But actually attempting that is risky. Ukrainians will have to go through the Sorovikin line, which somehow just keeps getting bigger. Ukraine's military intelligence may still think that it is a good gamble, but there remains some chance that they will face catastrophic losses. In turn, their support from the West could instantly evaporate. So yes, Ukraine could win the war by sawing the bridge in half, but Ukraine could also lose by trying. The true scenario may not be as optimistic, but could still induce Kyiv to try the strategy. Perhaps cutting the bridge in half was the original plan, but then the Bradley situation forced Ukraine to reevaluate the best course of action. That new report sitting on Zelensky's desk suggested a much safer alternative just liquidate the Russians currently in Ukraine. It would be costlier in terms of both money and lives, yes, but it would also have a higher chance of succeeding. Maybe the confidence in the intelligence report was low, but given the failed frontal assault, the updated probability of success swung in favor of the attrition strategy anyway. If the Kremlin's hands truly are tied, then the deployed Russian forces are not going to get any reinforcements. At some point, the defensive lines will become untenable, Sorovikin's efforts or not. And eventually, Russia is going to have to retreat, and Ukraine will be able to push forward with ease. This would essentially repeat the experience of November 2022. Now, is that actually what is happening? Again, we do not really know. As a starting point, from a casualty perspective, the defense has the advantage. Fortifications are fun, after all. And Ukraine cannot fall too far behind on the attrition ratio, further mobilizations or not. That also places a heavy onus on the West to make greater artillery commitments to let the metal do the hard work. There may be no more cost-effective solution than the 155mm shell and their friends. Inference-wise, the problem is that much of the cautious behavior that we are seeing could be the product of Ukraine having a suboptimal offensive. Or it could be because anything more is an unnecessary risk, given Russia's inability to mobilize. The one thing that suggests that Ukraine may be onto something here is that it is consistent with its Bakhmut strategy from the beginning of the year. Behind the scenes, U.S. officials were begging Ukraine to withdraw, but Kyiv insisted that its casualty ratios were favorable. Ukraine appeared to have made a good decision there, given that it led to the meltdown of Wagner. At least in terms of attitude, we are seeing the same thing now. That Kyiv seems perfectly happy to keep the attrition process going, even as Washington is pulling its hair out. Maybe Ukraine knows something that American intelligence does not. It has happened once before. In any case, we may be getting our answer soon about that mobilization question. Russia held regional elections on September 10th. 
Why autocratic governments hold elections at all should be the subject of its own video. It is not just Russia that does it. Even North Korea runs them too. But suffice it to say that autocratic governments can lose elections, particularly local ones, if things are really bad. Russia is best described as an informational autocracy. The Kremlin's stability comes in large part from controlling the media landscape and convincing its citizens that the current regime is the best for the country. Even if it can force a win, the government has to exert more effort to do so when there is greater dissatisfaction in the country. And even those wins can still turn into revolutions on the street. Coming off the heels of a very public mutiny by Wagner, and then an equally public fall from grace, another round of mobilization would have been a risky gamble for the Kremlin right before the election. But we are now entering a sweet spot. The next election in Russia is a big one. Mark your calendars now for March 17th, 2024. And this time, it is the presidential election, awarding a six-year term. Putin has not yet announced whether he is running, but that would be a safe bet. So when to mobilize? Doing so in January or February would be another bad idea politically. Meanwhile, immediately after the regional elections would also be suspicious. What this means is that if the Kremlin thinks that more troops will be necessary for the winter, and the gamble is worth it regardless of all the electoral incentives, then doing it in late September or early October would be the smart move. October 1st in particular would make sense, as it coincides with Russia's regular peacetime conscription. But anything in that range would give the Kremlin the most amount of time to do damage control before the presidential election. Or at least it would maximize the time for Russian citizens to cool off before going to the polls. Otherwise, the Kremlin is stuck until March, or perhaps after the May inauguration, with the troops that it currently has. That, in turn, increases the likelihood of a Russian military collapse. In other words, the election calendar may allow us to know soon whether the attrition strategy for Ukraine has paid off or not. On the other hand, a mobilization is not the end of the story. If Russia does try to institute another round of conscription, and Ukraine's intelligence about Russia's political vulnerabilities proves correct, then it could play into the hands of Kyiv anyway. But that is many steps down the road. Meanwhile, if you want to play something into your hands, might I suggest the lightning-fast delivery of my book on the causes of Russia's invasion? Check the video description for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care. So apparently, Manchester United is not very good right now. Truth be told, I literally just googled most Premier League titles and moved on with my life. Consider this my apology for living in my freedom bubble.